We're thinking this morning on the insanity of distrust. I think the title that Johnny had last time was the insanity of sin. Well, that was Saul. This is David. And he is no less possessing sanity than Saul was in many ways. We see here the insanity of distrust. And as we read the chapters, you might have been thinking, this sounds familiar. Did we not do this a few weeks back? And you probably thought that last week as Johnny read from the previous chapter. Well, did we not have this two weeks previously? And yes, you did. And yes, we did have this back in chapter 21. There was an American uh, baseball player named uh, Peter Berra, or Yogi Berra, as he was known, played in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and was famous for witty sayings that had a lot of wisdom in them. He once said, you can observe a lot by watching. Or about decision-making, when both things were sort of equal, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. But there's one that was especially relevant to our passage today. It's deja vu all over again. Well, it is deja vu all over again. We had deja vu last time as we looked at David and Saul in the, in the cave and David sparing Saul's life. But here's deja vu all over again. It's David returning to Gath. Did he not learn? He did that in chapter 21. After a great moment of success, David panicked, took his eye off God, and sought to protect himself by relying on his own resources. Strange in some ways how, like Saul, David can be. Saul returns to his sin, and David returns to his distrust, his failure to trust God. And why, why, why is there this almost copy and paste in the Bible? Could they not have left out this chapter and said, well, David did something similar? Why is it there in all its detail? Well, it's because don't we just keep doing the same thing ourselves? Imagine the angels looking down and shaking their heads and going, look, it's deja vu all over again in his life, in her life. Three things for us to see uh, this morning. First of all, the folly of believers. The folly of believers. Last time it was really the folly of the unbeliever. This, this week it's the folly of the believer. At last, David's longtime pursuer, Saul, seems to have grasped the point that God is making, that, that David is going to be king. And Saul has grasped that, that David is not going to kill him. And he proclaims as much in the end of chapter 26. I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. You have considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. May you be blessed, David, my son. And you would think at this point that David would think, this is it. This is the moment. I can sit back, put my feet up, the pressure is off. No more running and hiding. Jonathan, Samuel, Abigail, and now Saul have all said, I am to be God's king. Saul's attitude has changed. God is clearly on my side. He could have, Nabal has even been dealt with. You'd think David would have increased confidence in God's promises and God's power. But what do we read in verse 1 of chapter 27? Do you see it? But David thought to himself, One of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. And we find ourselves slipping back to chapter 21 which ended in David implicated in the deaths of God's people. How will this end? There's two things I want us to see here about where David goes wrong. He goes wrong because, and we go wrong because, we're talking to ourselves instead of preaching to ourselves. We're talking to ourselves instead of preaching to ourselves. Do you see? But David thought to himself, literally, the Hebrew is David spoke in his heart or spoke to his heart. David starts off by talking to himself about himself. 
One of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. He has a gallery of evidence that God is protecting him, that God will not let him fall into Saul's hands. He's seen God use the Philistines to protect him. He's seen God use Saul falling into a supernatural sleep so that David and his men can sneak into the camp. He's seen God use Saul's own family, his son and his daughter, to warn him, to protect him, to encourage him. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Should be David's question. But what's he saying to himself? Oh, one of these days I will be destroyed. He has seen God intercept David himself on the road to catastrophic folly. What grounds has he for thinking that one of these days Saul will triumph? There's no grounds. It'd be far easier, wouldn't it, to imagine Saul saying, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of David. David's fear is irrational and groundless. But isn't that our problem? Reason gets left at the door, or more significantly, God gets left at the door. And the problem here is in that opening line, David spoke to his heart, and what he said left God out of the situation completely. David spoke to his heart about his problem. And our problem is that we speak with ourselves when we should be preaching to ourselves. We speak with ourselves about ourselves when we should be talking to ourselves about God. Our problem is that we're speaking about our problem rather than preaching to ourselves about our God who has preserved us, who has promised us, who has provided for us, who has protected us. We make ourselves the focus of our thinking listening to ourselves when we should be preaching to ourselves. Or Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? You might think, surely that's the same thing. It's a bit of a yogi bearism, isn't it? But you see what he's saying? You get the, the contrast. We put the word preaching in. We're listening to ourselves, going over the same old stuff about the same old stuff, instead of bringing God's truth into our lives. Instead of looking at Saul's hand, I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. David should have been looking at God's hand, which had been doing so much for him. He should have been reminding himself of God's actions in this current difficulty. He should have been reminding himself of God's actions right from the start when David fought the lion and the bear, when he fought Goliath. He should have been reminding himself of God's promises, which had encouraged him through Samuel, through Jonathan, through Abigail. He should have been reminding himself that God has had people sent to strengthen him. Think of Jonathan walking into camp that day. Think of Abigail intercepting him. Think of God the prophet coming and speaking to him. But he talks to himself about his circumstances rather than God. You find yourself doing that. Listening to yourself rather than God. Ending up doubting his promises. Doubting his forgiveness. Doubting his power. I came across a a quote by a psychiatrist. I was listening to a a book about trauma. And there was a sentence in it that was repeated twice. The greatest source of our suffering is the lies we tell ourselves. The greatest source of our suffering is the lies we tell ourselves. And that's what's going on here. David, you see, there's only truth when we factor God into the equation. We leave God out of the equation Although the, the little bit of what we're saying might be in some ways f- seem to us to be factually true, if we've left God out of the equation, it isn't the whole story. Do we, what do we preach to ourselves? Have we accusations running in a loop in our heads? You can't do this. You're worthless. You're stupid. You're second rate. Failure is inevitable. Shame, 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 blame, blame, fear, worry, anxiety. 
or the what ifs running round and round our minds. What if this happens and then that happens and the other happens? Or maybe it's frustrations at people. And that goes over and over and they did this and they said that and, that, and I'll give them this and I'll show them that. And I, or it's circumstances. If this wasn't the case and if that wasn't the case, then I could be this and I could be that. Or this would be different. Or maybe it's our achievements. And we have them on repeat in our heads, preaching them to ourselves to, to boost our sense of self-worth. And we're, we're leaving God out. We're, leaving, we're preaching to ourselves about ourselves. And here's the believer's folly. The believer's folly is that we don't believe. We don't take the truths that have been given to us and believe them. We don't replay the helpful things in our heads. We don't replay God's truth. We replay our own notions. Are you preaching? Or are you listening? What should David have done? You know, we sang from Psalm 103. I'm so struck by the beginning of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me, be stirred up to bless and praise His holy name. What's David doing? He's, he's come, on, come on, soul, pull yourself together. Think about who God is. It's as if here's David doing in Psalm 103 what he didn't do in 1 Samuel 27. He's learned his lesson. This is what I need to be at. And he starts to list, don't forget. Come on, soul. Don't forget all his benefits. Remember, remember, remember he forgives. Remember he heals. Remember he redeems. Remember he has a crown for you. Remember his love. Remember his compassion. Remember how he provides good things. Remember, remember, remember. That's what he should have been doing. That's what we need to be doing, preaching, not listening. But the second thing where we see the folly of the believer is taking matters into our own hands instead of leaving them in his hands. So we're talking to ourselves instead of preaching to ourselves, and then we're taking matters into our own hands instead of leaving them in his hands. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. We read in verse uh, 1, verse 2, well, verse 1. Verse 2 we read, So David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish, king of Gath. He left God out of the problem and so he leaves God out of the solution. You see that? Because God wasn't in his focus in his thinking about his circumstances, God wasn't in focus when it came to finding a solution and he calls it the best thing. The best thing I can do. Well how did it work for you before? How did that turn out for you? The last time you went to the Philistines and you were afraid for your life Is it really the best thing to leave the land that God gave to his people? Is it the best thing not to seek God's guidance? You know, there's some writers and preachers want to justify David's actions at this time. And they they say, you know, the passage is silent on whether he does right or wrong. But we've seen this trajectory before. And we've heard David's commentary on that trajectory in Psalm 34, where he said, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Just stop doing wrong. Stop lying. What's there, what do we find him doing in this chapter? Again, he's doing wrong. Again, he's telling lies. And so, we've seen this trajectory. We can have sympathy with David. He's in a predicament. The pressures, the long, hard grind get to him. We can have sympathy, but we need to see this as unwise and sinful. There is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, the Bible says it leads to death. Again, he takes up residence with the Philistines. Why would you go to the Philistines for help? Again, he engages in deceit pretending to be attacking Israel when he's actually attacking other nations. This time he adds brutality to it, not leaving any alive. Someone might say, but didn't God say that those nations were to be destroyed? Yes, but the narrator is very clear 
very careful that the reason, and he gives it twice, that David does it, is not out of obedience to God, but to prevent there being anybody left to reveal his deceitfulness. So one of the things to note with David here is that, you know, in a sense, he started out so strong with David, or with Goliath, in his faith, so strong in his faith. But as the years have passed, and he's seen more of life, he seems to become more confident in his ability and more aware of, of the long pressures of, of life and, 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 and thinks that all these need to be factored in. And you put them all into the mix. But he's forgotten God. And God dwarfs everything else. And this is what can happen is we start out in the Christian life and we are so amazed at God and that we trust him. And then we start to become more streetwise more experienced, more knowledgeable. What happens? We factor in our thinking as if our thinking and God's thinking are somehow need to be welded together. Not at all. God's way is right and we are to bring our thinking under His instruction. And when we take things into our own hands, we find ourselves making a colossal mess. Yes, for David it seems to go well for a while. Akish trusts him. David's left to get on with what he wants to get on with. And just at that very moment the narrative breaks off. Just as we begin to see that the Philistines are gearing up for battle against the people of Israel and David is about to have his bluff called and what will happen? He is in this terrible predicament. He has dug a hole that's so deep that only God could extract him from it. Well, what's going to happen? He's going to be facing Saul in battle. He's going to be implicated in the deaths of God's people yet again. This is where his way of doing it has led him. It has been a disaster. And do you see how the disaster is emphasized? You know, as we read on, here's the insanity of trying to sort things out for yourself, but the disaster of going our way is emphasized whenever you hear the Hebrew commanders say, what are these Hebrews doing here? And yes, they're asking it because they're puzzled. But to hear it in another way, you're in a bad place whenever the Philistines are pointing out the oddness or the incongruity of where you're at. You're in a bad place whenever unbelievers are going, what are you doing here? I expect me to be here, but you? No. What are you doing here? Oh, well, I took matters into my own hands and tried to sort my life out my way. Well, how's that working for you? What are you doing here? We're in a bad place. And you know, this is brilliant writing. God is only mentioned twice in these two chapters, and it's from the lips of Achish, the pagan. Not from David, from Achish, the pagan. You're in a bad place when pagans talk more about God than you do. When people who aren't Christians talk more about God than you do. When they are more aware of God's ways than you seem to be. What a, what a terrible thing. It's a bad job too when the Philistines look more honest than God's king. What a rebuke this is to us. Are there solutions that you've come up with See, we've got to ask this question, don't we? Are there solutions that you've come up with to problems in your life that would surprise a Philistine? It would make them say, what are you doing? What are you doing here? When they're more prepared to talk about God in a situation than you are. That's the challenge that comes from this. Our places in our work, in our relationships, in what we're looking at, in the people that we hang out with, where it might be said to us, what are you doing here? In the ways we're trying to solve a problem, we've left God out, and somebody might say, what are you doing? Here's the insanity of distrust. When our alarm is not regulated by our faith. 
when our anxiety overpowers our belief, we do a David when we listen to ourselves rather than God, when we rely on our ways, when we seek our own solution. The folly of believers is that we fail to believe and we fail to trust. So look at David and look at yourselves in the mirror. Are we listening to ourselves when we should be preaching to ourselves? Are we solving things ourselves when we should be looking for God and His way? So, the folly of believers, our second and third point, are much shorter. Secondly, the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God set against the repeated folly of David is the steadfast faithfulness of God. David is wandering, but God is not. And why are we told all these details? It's to show us the unseen ways of God who is always faithful. Isn't it good to have a faithful God? And there's two things for us to marvel at here. Marvel, first of all, at the unshakable faithfulness of God. Here goes David again. Here he goes again. You know, it does seem to be every other chapter, doesn't it? There's something wonderful. The Philistines, we read, are gathering at Aphek. That's ominous. That's where the Israelites have been defeated before and they are captured. David is getting sucked in. And we think, how can, how can anybody get out of this? But we know something, or if we had read chapter 28, we would know something that David doesn't know. That this day of battle will be the day that Saul and Jonathan will die. And no genius on David's part. If he goes into that battle, no genius in his part will ever separate him from the taint of having been involved in Saul and Jonathan's death. And we're being sucked into it. And we can see, how is he ever going to get out of this? The Philistines are marching and David and his troops are there. And who is going to come to his rescue? God. God doesn't abandon his king, his people to their stupidity and sin. Sometimes... He does as he does here. And he lets us get good and deep into our stupidity and into our folly so that we cry out to him. And when we do that, when we do that, we see the faithfulness of God, the the tenacious, unshakable faithfulness of God. We don't deserve mercy. Remember Psalm 69. Be merciful to me, the psalmist cried out. We don't deserve it. We have no record here of David actually crying out. Maybe that some of those psalms are a reflection of, of him crying out at this point. But God is a God of mercy and grace. We deserve to be left. But he is intent on saving us from our sins. And here is a picture of the tenacious, unshakable faithfulness of God. How thankful we should be that we have a God who doesn't let go. Now let's be very careful. That is no excuse that we continue in sin. For if we continue in willful sin, the Bible tells us that we are not a follower of Jesus Christ. You can't follow sin and follow Christ. Repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Nor does it allow us to gaily indulge in sin and expect God to sweep up the pieces. As we read through the story of David, we find that David ploughs on in his sin with Bathsheba and it is catastrophic for David and for his family and for the nation. But I think what we see here is that willful sin is different from stupid sin. Sin that grows out of pressure and bad decision-making from relentless trial and from forgetting God. David's scenario here is very different from sitting with his feet up in the palace when he should have been at battle, looking out a window when he should have been away off to war. Scenario is different. God knows when we have stumbled into a hole of our own making. And rather than leaving us to flounder, his mercy is enlivened. And here is encouragement for us. Our stupidity... And our sinfulness 
is not a barrier to God's mercy. We may find that our sin causes all sorts of havoc, but it is still not a barrier to God's mercy. We have a God who is faithful to save us. So we should marvel at God's faithfulness. Would you not have given up on David by this stage? God didn't. And how good it is that we have a God who doesn't give up on us. His faithfulness is unshakable. And the second thing we're to marvel at is marvel at the unthwartable ways of God. God's ways cannot be thwarted. Marvel at the unthwartable ways of God. God is never stuck for a solution. How does he get David out of this predicament here? David is in deeper than he knows. For God's timetable is that this very day will be the day when Saul dies. And David thinks, I've got a plan. I can turn this around. But God has set the sovereign overall plan. There will be no turning it around. It will only be disaster for David. And along come the Philistine commanders. Uh, excuse me, Akish. What's that fellow doing here? Those Jewish soldiers, what are they doing here? And there's God's solution. Incredible, isn't it? We see God's sovereignty over people, not just his own people, but he uses whomever he wishes. If he has to use a few Philistine leaders, he will. Dale Ralph Davis says he can make the enemy serve us as a friend. Agish doesn't want to let David go, but he can't overrule his fellow commanders. David bizarrely tries to argue his case. How often do we do that? They go, I know God says this, but I've got a plan. My way. I know God says that, but we'll do it my way. You know, we look at David going, David, you fool. And we see a reflection in David of ourselves. God gives us a way out, and we are determined to not take it. You know, it makes me think that David did have a plan, but he didn't know what God was planning, and it would have been a disaster. And how this should encourage us, we see God's hidden care coming through unexpected channels. And he does that. He does that even in trivial ways. We lost our car keys uh, this week on a very grassy, steep hill with lots of mud uh, and all the rest of it. And um, God sent along a guy called Logan, who managed to pick the right path up the muddy slope to where our keys had fallen. He said, here they are here. Incredible, the ways of God. That's a trivial example. If he does that for car keys, why would we ever leave God out of our reckoning? Why would we ever seek to find solutions in our own hands? There are God's ways and there are our ways. And one set are wise and one set are foolish. How could we leave God out of our thinking? His ways are beyond measuring and counting. He can do things, as, as Eliphaz puts it in the book of Job, wonders that cannot be fathomed. And we think, well, well this, is, this is the way it's going to be and nothing will change and it can't. No, no, we've left God out of the story. We mustn't do that. This is why we should trust him, listen to him, preach to ourselves about him and not rely on our own resources. We need to preach to ourselves about the incredible ways of God, even the, the trivial things that he's done for us. So that if we're convinced that he can sort out the trivial things and he can sort out the eternal things, he can sort out everything in between. We need to remind ourselves of God's promises. We need to preach to ourselves of God's acts in our history and in history and in Scripture. The faithfulness of God. And then to close with, we must see this. The steadfastness of Christ. The steadfastness of Christ. Now you're wondering, maybe, well, Jesus isn't mentioned here. Where's this coming from? Well, I've been reading through the Psalms that David composed 
in this wilderness time, Psalm 52 to 59. And I've been asking one question. Because you see, the Psalms were written by David, many of them by David, but they were all written for Jesus. And where David speaks about facing opposition from sinful men. He's giving words for Jesus to use. When David speaks about being plotted against, he's giving Jesus words for him to use. When David speaks of being betrayed, that finds its fulfillment in Jesus being betrayed. When David speaks of fearing the reality and prospect of death, those words are written for Jesus to use. And as you hear them come from Christ's lips, I'm struck forcibly by the terrible reality of the pressure Jesus faced. We look at David and we think, well, Saul is hunting him down in this wilderness for years. What awful pressure, what relentless pressure. And then we see that's a little miniature portrait of what Jesus faced. That's why this happens to show us the pressures that God's anointed king would face. And as we we marvel at David's ups and downs, we come to Jesus and we realize the pressures were ratcheted up even further. Listen to some of these psalms. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your name. Hear my prayer, O God. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. Hear David's words from the lips of Jesus. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror, horror has overwhelmed me. All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Record my misery. You hear Jesus say that? List my tears on your scroll. And then he says, Psalm 56, verse 12, I must perform my vows to you, O God. When I'm afraid, Psalm 56, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. I will perform my vows. I will not flinch. I will not buckle. I will be steadfast. I will not seek a way out. I will not rely on my own wisdom. I will believe what God has said. And you know what he says to us? Jesus, singing through the words of David, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Preach that to yourself. Preach that. And all that David experienced in the wilderness years was a picture of what Jesus would experience in his lifetime. Not literally in a wilderness, but as opposition intensified, as people forsook him, as earth and hell plotted against him. And what David said in verse 1 of chapter 27, one of these days I will be destroyed, could be said more accurately of Jesus. One of these days I will be swept away. And yet, as we listen to these psalms and hear the voice of Jesus singing them, I'm really hit by his determination to steadfastly hold the course, not to listen to his fears, not to seek the easier path, but to be steadfast for my sake and for yours. I will perform my vows. I will do what I said I would do, Jesus said. I want you to see the steadfastness of Christ. I want you to see His commitment for your good. Could you trust Him? He who went through so much so that you could be forgiven and belong. And now that faithful king sits on a throne, giving promises, giving wisdom, giving grace, giving strength, giving help. And even if it is deja vu all over again for him and for us, he will help us under unrelenting pressure. 
He will help us as we face the long grind of keeping on following. He will surprise us with the means he uses. He will show grace when we have dug a hole through our own stupidity. So how do we do all this? Well, a verse that we were due to be looking at this evening. God willing, we'll look at it in a couple of weeks' time in Hebrews 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of trust. He helps us to trust. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him. Consider him who is faithful so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus' determination on the weight of the cross. You could trust such a one, couldn't you? Who went through that so that all that would ever happen to you as you would walk in his ways would be for your good. Amen. If you're able, let's stand as we come to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we are stupid, foolish people. We forget the one who should be unforgettable. We lose sight of the one who is so immense that you should fill our field of vision. We let slip from our memories things that should never move from our memories, things too wondrous for us to recount that the Son of God would go to the cross bearing my sin in his body to the tree. And we forget the depths and the length and the height and the breadth of your love for us. We forget the extraordinary, complex, multi-layered, multi-faceted wisdom of God. We forget that we're fools and we begin to think that we're wise and we begin to think that you've dropped the ball that you've lost sight of something that, that, that you've forgotten us and oh Lord forgive us for our folly forgive us for our lunatic thinking and Lord help us to preach to ourselves instead of listening to ourselves Help us to catch ourselves on. We find ourselves coming up with a solution out of our own tiny little ant-sized brains. Lord, help us. And whenever following you seems hard, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus so that we can be convinced that he is only out for our good and for our best, and will only ever do what's good for us. And his ways are true and kind and merciful. And help us to see that the risen Jesus is now seated in the throne, promising and providing all that we need for whatever he tells us to do, and that the God who commands is that the God who equips and the God who enables. And Lord, help us. Help us to keep walking in right ways. Let us stray no more in paths of foolishness. We pray, for we ask it for Christ's honour and glory. Amen.